Hi, everyone. My name is Bob. I am passionate about technology, data, and personal optimization, which means I track a lot of things about myself. For example, uh, over the past year, I've averaged about 6.8 hours of sleep per night, with the most sleep on Sundays and the least amount on Wednesdays. Um, I've quantified my body in terms of how I respond to action-packed sci-fi thrillers in an IMAX theater, or how I respond to a day betting on horses at the racetrack. This is what two weeks of my location data looks like in and around New York City. I've had my DNA and gut microbiome analyzed to understand the effects of genetics and diet on my uh, health. And it looks like I'm, uh, my productivity is up about 5% over last week. I also typically listen to music in the evening, and when I do, it's most often indie rock. So why do I track? Uh, my background is as an entrepreneur, and there's this great business quote that goes, you can't manage what you can't measure. But I feel this goes beyond business and can apply to, uh, apply to ourselves. When I began tracking, the tools were very basic. Technology now allows us to measure and quantify lots of different areas of our lives. And when I started in my teens and 20s, my focus was really on athletic performance. And as I've gotten older, things have shifted towards um, longevity and personal optimization. Now, you're probably thinking all this tracking would probably, probably be overwhelming for most people, and I would say you're right. But guess what? You don't have to track a million things in order to improve your well-being. In medicine, there's a, a term called minimum effective dose, and it's defined as the smallest dose of a drug that will provide clinically significant efficacy. But applying this to oneself, we can think of it as the simplest um, steps needed to obtain a desired result. I call it minimum effective quantification. So I'm going to show you a few things that we should all be following that are very easy to track and will basically give us insights and allow us to better understand and optimize our health. First up is glucose. Now, glucose is a, um, a small sugar substance that your body um, uses as fuel for energy uh, for our brain, muscles, and many organs and tissues. Our bodies will tightly regulate glucose levels. Uh, we'll release some into the bloodstream when we need energy or store it for later use. Our bodies then use insulin to signal cells to bring glucose back in from the bloodstream. Uh, and if left in the bloodstream, we end up with elevated levels of glucose, which can really cause a lot of bad things like cellular damage. So the American Diabetes Association and other organizations like them have established guidelines for what they consider to be normal fasting glucose levels. But longevity and anti-aging research organizations have actually suggested that those ranges should be a bit lower. I became interested in my own glucose when, after an annual checkup, my uh, glucose level was at a level that was considered good, but, but not optimal. And um, I want to be optimal. I don't know about you. So I started taking um, a much deeper look into my own glucose and, and trends around it. Also, my DNA showed that I had an elevated risk for type 2 diabetes. So this is a glucose monitor. They're pre pretty inexpensive, really easy to use. They work by just simply drawing a drop of blood from your fingertip, touching it to a test strip that's inserted into the meter, and in a few seconds, you'll, you'll get a result. So I started taking daily fasting glucose readings, meaning as soon as I woke up, before I had any food or drink. And as you can see, over 30 days, there's a bit of variability in these numbers. Uh, some days I was optimal, and other days I was far from it. I wanted to dig a little deeper into my trends and what would cause these levels to fluctuate the way they did. So I, I averaged them by day of week. And I could see that on Mondays, uh, levels were the highest, probably because of the, like, the start of the work week. Uh, I went down a bit on Tuesday, back up on Wednesday, and trended back down towards the weekend. So I started digging a bit deeper into what was causing this effect. And looking at my calendar, I realized I play soccer on Wednesday and Friday nights in a, in, in a league. And it seems that that type of exercise, that um, intense um, interval training, has a lowering effect on my glucose the following morning. So that's pretty cool. So I kept doing this over a period of months, and now you can see a trend over a period of about three months. And I was looking for other insights into my glucose to understand what affects my body in positive and negative ways. Looking at the chart here, if you look towards the right side of it and you see a couple um, elevated spikes in the data, well, those happen to be 
uh, dates that I was actually traveling by air. So it actually shows that for me, uh, travel has a negative impact on my glucose, and I, whether it's traveling from east to west or at different elevations. So now I've gone from you know, just a basic uh, point in time to something that's giving me longer-term trends. But I wanted to know even more about my glucose. I wanted to get more data points per day. And I came across this small disposable sensor that you wear for a period of about two weeks that will continuously sample and monitor your body's uh, glucose levels. In fact, I'm actually wearing one right now. <laughs> so what this allows is going from something like this for each day to something like this. So now I get insights into things like what's happening while I'm sleeping, after eating meals, or while exercising. On this particular day, you could see there was a dip in my glucose overnight, uh, which actually resulted in some sleep disruptions. And as I woke up, your, my glucose gradually rose in the first hour as my body started pulling glucose from my liver to now uh, power my now awake body. I normally don't go out for lunch, but on this day, I, I guess I did, and I thought I was getting a, a healthy meal, and it looks like my body reacted um, negatively to something in that meal, which later turned out to be chickpeas, as is the culprit. And that evening, I had a soccer match. And what was interesting was my glucose levels rose leading up to the match, which to me might just mean that uh, adrenaline had a part to play in it, because as soon as the match started happening, uh, levels came right back down. So a few years ago, I was training for my first uh, marathon, and partway through, I competed in my first half marathon. And every, it was a hot, humid day, and everything was going pretty well, according to as, as planned, but I got about a quarter mile from the finish line when I started to bonk. Actually, worse than bonk, my body metabolically shut down, and I passed out. I woke up in an ambulance with uh, some IV bags hooked up to my arm, and don't worry, everything was okay, I was fine. And you can see I'm still wearing my running shoes in the picture. So, so even if you're not running a marathon every day, the real lesson here is that uh, you were trying to get to a goal, but you were stopped by something that you could have prevented with having access to data. So if I was wearing, like, let's say, a continuous glucose monitor while I was racing, it would have alerted me to the fact that my blood sugar was going way too low and I should probably consume a sports drink. Next up is heart rate variability. When we think of our heartbeat, it's usually measured in terms of beats per minute. So you, your pulse might be 60 beats a minute at rest or 120 beats per minute when doing some moderate exercise. However, our hearts don't beat like a metronome. There's actually a slight uh, variability between each heartbeat interval, and that's known as heart rate variability, or HRV. Uh, HRV is actually a measure of heart health and can be used as a measure of health in general. Now, our HRV is controlled uh, unconsciously by our body's autonomic nervous system, and it has two branches, uh, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. So when we're at relaxing or uh, doing things like eating or digesting, our parasympathetic nervous system takes over. It's also called our rest and digest nervous system. But under periods of stress, our sympathetic nervous system takes over. Now, we don't have to worry about being chased by lions anymore, but Modern living really hits us with a lot of different types of stressors that can put us in a chronically um, stressed out state that would mimic the fight or flight state. So in this particular case, uh, someone could have a very stressful morning, rough commute to work, lots of meetings, and that would be considered bad stress. Good stress would be things like some restorative exercise. And then uh, recovery would be eating, unwinding before bed, and sleeping. So the, really the trick here is, you want to have a balance of good and bad. Some stress is, is good, but you want to balance the good and bad. So you measure HRV by wearing a chest strap. A lot of runners will wear these types of chest straps. And what you want to do is actually capture HRV first thing in the morning before you even get out of bed. And you do this over a period of time, so let's say a week, and you'll establish your baselines to see um, like over a seven-day baseline. There are, are actually a few apps out there now that will let you capture it using the, um, off your finger using a smartphone camera. So this is what my uh, four-month HRV trend looks like. The solid white line is a moving average and gives us a, a good sense of my overall HRV trends. We can also look at HRV in terms of day-to-day -day variability. Uh, this is a great way to look at things like how, if I maybe overtrained yesterday, I should re uh, recover or rest today. 
Uh, and another insight I found in my HRV data was on days where I consumed two or fewer drinks of alcohol, my HRV actually went up, which is kind of weird. Uh, I realized, that, again, looking at my calendar, that those were evenings that I was out socializing with good friends. So it actually appears that alcoholism would increase my HRV. It was the fact that I was out being social with people that I really care about. And there's a lot of research that backs this up. They actually have shown that um, building good social connections is a key factor in cr increasing one's HRV. And they've also shown that people with chronically low levels of uh, HRV are typically have signs of depression. And athletes will use, again, this um, metric, uh, like whether you're professional or amateur, as a way to uh, track their recovery, rest, when they can go hard, et cetera. And it, I think you know, whether you want to run a 10K or do restorative yoga or, or just you know, have a nice workout or recover that day, HRV is a great metric for all that. So we have all these tools, and we can collect all, these all this data about our bodies, but we often overlook our environment, which can have a bigger effect on our health and well-being than counting the number of steps we take. So the average person today actually spends as much as 90% of their time indoors. And studies have shown that our indoor air quality can be anywhere from 2 to 20 times more toxic than the outside. And poor air quality can lead a whole series of uh, both acute and chronic issues. There are many, many sources of uh, poor air quality in our home. There's particulate matter, which come from things like dust, pollen, pet dander. There are toxic vapors known as volatile organic compounds that come from everything from cosmetics to cleaning supplies to upholstered furniture and carpets to even building materials. Carbon monoxide is called the silent killer because it's an odorless, uh, tasteless, colorless gas that comes from things like car exhaust or appliances that burn fuel. And similarly, nitrogen dioxide can come from cars and vehicles, as well as um, things like space heaters and things like that. There's carbon dioxide, which uh, we exhale when we breathe, but also can come from home heating systems. And we also have uh, things like mold and, and bacteria that can grow when humidity levels get out of control. So since I spend about a third of my life in my bedroom, that's where I sleep, I, I decided I would uh, start looking at the effects of air quality in my bedroom. So the first thing I needed was a way to measure my air quality, and monitor it. Now there, are, there were a lot of industrial type of solutions available that can cost thousands of dollars. I wanted something that was more affordable and that would suit my needs uh, best. So I actually built my own air quality monitor using some plans I found online. So I set it up in my bedroom and started collecting data. So this is a 24-hour snapshot of the conditions in my bedroom, uh, going from midnight to midnight. And overall, there's, this set of data has, has nothing really too um, spectacular going on. You can see that the humidity and pressure trends mirror what was going on outside. And um, you can even see the light levels change as we go from sunrise to sunset, and when perhaps someone turned the bedroom lights on or was watching TV before bed. But once we start looking at some of the other sensor data, this is where things get more interesting. And we live in New York City, so we typically keep our windows and door closed at night. So what ends up happening overnight is the air quality goes down as we're exhaling carbon dioxide, things are building up. And it's not until the morning when someone opens the door and a rush of fresh air comes in that we see an improvement to air quality. We also happen to live across the street from a giant grocery store, and there are delivery trucks that come all morning. And you can actually see that there's a spike in nitrogen dioxide in the mornings while these deliveries are happening. So this means that even if my windows are closed, they're drafty and some of that, um, those gases are getting into my home. And something that I found while tracking this was that I had a, a clothes dryer that was actually not properly ventilated. Uh, you can see the spike in the afternoon. Fortunately, I wasn't running this while I was sleeping. So you don't have to go out and spend a ton of money on an air quality monitor. Fortunately, there are a number of affordable options available that you simply connect onto your Wi-Fi network, you plug in, and you can get data real-time through a smartphone app and provide you with lots of actionable insights. So in closing, technology has given us the ability to track and collect immense amounts of data about ourselves, but it doesn't have to overwhelm us. By focusing on just three things in under 10 minutes a week, we can gain simple, actionable insights that allow us to gain a better understanding of our bodies and our environment and allow us to proactively take measures to understand and optimize our health and become superhuman. Thanks.